All right, from zero to two seconds. This is the inhaling part of the cycle. And so we're going to start to inhale now. So if air is flowing into our lungs, what must be true about the pressure in the alveoli? No. It's going to go down, right? We need less pressure in the alveoli than in the uh, atmosphere so that air will flow into the lungs. So the pressure in our lungs has dropped. How did we do that? Well, we actively moved the walls of that thoracic cavity out, and the lungs followed. So we increased the volume of our lungs, which dropped the pressure, which allowed air to flow in. But when we did that, when we moved, for instance, those ribs out, right, it's pulling those, um, the outer layer of the pleura out also, and so it's slightly increasing the volume in that space between the two layers. So what happens in the, to the pressure in there? It also goes down. So we have a decreasing interpleural pressure as we expand those lungs and pull them out, pull the walls out. All right, the volume of the alveoli is it's going up. We're inhaling. We're filling up those lungs with air. Okay. We got that down? If you're raising your hand, I can't see you because it's such a bright mind. You have to yell at me in a nice way. Okay, so the first half of this figure, the gray part here. So we're inhaling, so air is flowing into our lungs. That's because the pressure in our lungs is less than the atmospheric pressure. So this pressure here is a negative pressure compared to the atmosphere. The pressure in the interpleural space is decreasing as we keep expanding those lungs and pulling out putting a strain between those two layers of the, um, of the pleura, we get a lower and lower pressure in that space. All right, we're at the two second mark now, halfway through the cycle. We just finished inhaling, but we haven't started exhaling yet. Okay. So what's the pressure like in the alveoli? It's what? Equal. Equal to the atmosphere. There's no air movement, so there must be no pressure gradient between the alveoli and the atmosphere. That's right. The interpleural pressure, right, we've got the walls of our thoracic cavity out as far as we're going to. Right, pulling it out, pulling out, and those, um, that inner layer to the pleura is really trying to pull in because it's attached to the lungs, and the lungs are trying to recoil. And so the interpleural pressure is at its minimum. The, the most negative that it will be during the cycle. And the volume of the alveoli, it's actually at its maximum. We've inhaled as much as we're going to. Okay. All right, so we're right in the middle of the year. So we finished inhaling, but we haven't started exhaling yet. The pressure in the um, alveoli is back to atmospheric pressure. Right? It's no longer negative and it's not positive yet. And the pressure in the interpleural space is at its lowest value, it's at its minimum. The most negative that it will be. Everything stretched out as much as it will. All right, we're ready to exhale. So that's seconds two to, to four. So the pressure in the alveoli as we exhale it's got to be greater than the atmospheric pressure. If we're going to push air out, the pressure must be, I'm sorry, air out, the pressure must be higher in the lungs than it is outside in the atmosphere. That interpleural pressure, it's going to come back up. Right? It's going to stay negative, but it won't be as negative. And then the volume of the alveoli is decreasing. Right? We're exhaling, we're losing volume. Okay, everybody got that? All right. So it's the blue part of the graph. We're exhaling, so the volume is decreasing. The pressure in the lungs is greater than the atmospheric pressure. It's a positive value to push that air out. And the interpleural pressure is rising back up. Okay, it's increasing. All right, and last one at four seconds. So at this point, we've already finished exhaling, and we haven't started inhaling yet which should sound very familiar. It's the same as at time equals zero seconds. Right? So we're going to start and end at the same place of the cycle. 
So the pressure in the alveoli is equal to atmospheric pressure. Interpleural pressure is at its maximum. And the pressure, I'm sorry, volume in the alveoli is at its minimum. Got all the air out that we're going to. All right, have we got this done? Okay, so at this point we're at the far right side, which is the same as the far left side. We just finished exhaling. We haven't started inhaling yet. Pressure in the alveoli equals atmospheric pressure, and the temporal pressure is at its maximum. All right. So remember the flow is proportional to the change in pressure over resistance, so we just went over the whole pressure uh, part. Let's go ahead and take a look at resistance. Resistance to flow. No one's going to claim that phone right now. Okay. All right. So what is going to influence the resistance to airflow through our airways? So this would be for instance, our, um, our pharynx, larynx, trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, all of those airways. Well, one is the length. Does the length of our airways change at all? They stretch my neck. Do we have further to breathe? As I get older, my neck stretches? <laughs> Right, so when you were newborn, your airways were a lot shorter, right? They're a lot longer now. Right? Um, so it did change over time, but you guys are pretty much stuck with the length of airways that you have now. Right? It's not going to change. All right, so we're going to consider that mostly constant. Does somebody have emergency going on? I mean, this thing just keeps buzzing. Doesn't need to be checked. All right. Uh, what else? Viscosity, all right? We talked about this with the cardiovascular system, right? Viscosity of blood. Well, now we can talk about the viscosity of that air that we're moving in and out of our lungs, right? So that's really important. So if the, the fluid that we're breathing has a higher viscosity, it's going to be harder to get it to come in and to go out. Does the viscosity of our air really change? Yes. Air where? Florida. Air in Florida. Should we go to Florida, Mexico City, and try it out? No, you don't want to go to Florida? <laughs> Have you been? I just read about it. No, you've been. There's some cool things about it. I mean, alligators are crawling around. How cool is that? You guys aren't into that? How about like in Denver? I mean, I know people say it's like hard. Harder to breathe, but no, it's altitude. Altitude makes it thinner. thinner. It's the thinner the air is thinner. Air is thinner. Air is thinner. What do you mean by thinner air? I mean, uh, you mean less humid? There's less oxygen. There's less oxygen. Yeah, there's less total air pressure, and there's less oxygen available. So that has um, a lot to do with it. It's harder, harder to breathe air. It feels more laborious, so you have to breathe more to get the same amount of oxygen. So that's a little bit. I mean, there's viscosity involved in that. Um, but humidity, you mentioned, I think someone else had mentioned that as well. So that can contribute to viscosity. So if you're in a really humid place, um, yeah, so well, the humidity can make the, the air thicker, and so it's harder to drive it through your airways. The smog has some other complications to it, too, because um, that causes your airways to constrict because you're sensing this toxin in the air that you're trying to minimize getting into your lungs, but unfortunately that's all that's available. And so that can cause airways to constrict, and some people are more sensitive to that, and cause it to constrict so much you can't even get air in that. Um, so we're not going to make a field trip to yeah. super smoggy places. <laughs> we're not going to Southern California. Although, we've got our own share of smog in the area. Right? Um, all right, so viscosity though, what about, let's say we're not going to all these exotic places. Um, and the weather doesn't change too dramatic too fast, viscosity is really not going to change that much. Right? So for instance, just sitting in here for that hour and a half, viscosity really hasn't changed much. So we're going to consider that mostly constant. Yeah, it can vary a bit, but from minute to minute, it's not going to change a significant amount. 
All right, the radius of the airways. Right. Can we change the radius of the airways? Well, first of all, let's think back to, we talk about blood vessels. How does that influence the resistance? If it's a bigger radius, there's less resistance to flow, just like with um, blood vessels, right? So if you've got a really big pipe, it's easier to get air in and out than if you have a really skinny pipe. All right, can we change the radius of our airways? All right, does that trachea get tighter? Um, what, can we use that example of smog or allergies? I kind of blew it by brazing that example already, right? Because I did mention that they constrict. Does your trachea get smaller though? No, why not? Yes, I, oh, <laughs> I like that, that's good. All right, well, first of all, you don't have muscles in there to control the radius, and also you've got those cartilaginous rings that keep it fairly constant. All right, what about the bronchi? Yeah, looking at the plant, you can get a lot of mucus. You can, so that functionally changes the radius. If you get a bunch of gunk lining the inside, right, or if they, the tissue swells, but can you actively change the radius of that? No, they also have those cartilaginous rings in them. Yeah. So I was thinking more of bronchioles. Well, what were you thinking about with bronchioles? Um, the, no, the same thing I just said now, that that can happen with smooth muscle contracting there. There's less cartilage and you can get mucus clogging it. Right, I mean, you don't even have to go to the mucus level, I mean, that can contribute to it. But the bronchioles, the smallest of those tubes, they don't have the cartilaginous rings on them, but they do have smooth muscle um, in their walls. So they can, those radii can change, right? And they do change in response to whatever's in the air, right? So that smog can cause them to constrict. Okay? Or if you've got an asthma attack, right? A, a um, inappropriate immune response to something that's out there in the air, that can cause those bronchioles to get tighter and make it harder to get air in and out. The resistance to flow goes way up. All right, so it is variable in the bronchioles. All right, so what's going to cause changes in the bronchial radius or diameter? The radius is just twice the diameter. Well, bronchoconstriction, making your bronchioles skinnier, decreasing the radius or the diameter. That can be in response to uh, neurons or paracrines. So you can stimulate the smooth muscle in those walls to contract, and then that squeezes down on those bronchioles. Bronchodilation. What's going to make those smooth muscles relax and allow your bronchioles to get larger? Well, one thing could be a rise in the amount of carbon dioxide. Your body senses more carbon dioxide, then you make those bronchioles larger so it's easier to get air to flow in and out. You're going to be able to flush your body out of that carbon dioxide more easily. So just some examples of what would contribute to the radius or diameter of your bronchioles, which all lead back to the resistance to airflow. Questions about this? All right, we're doing it. So we just covered ventilation, how to get air into our lungs and how to get that air back out of our lungs. So now what we need to do is take a look at gas exchange. How are we gonna get the oxygen in our alveoli into our blood? And the carbon dioxide in our blood into the alveoli? We're going to see it's the same process involved in internal gas exchange. All right, so gas exchange, remember we've got external and internal. And external is between your alveoli and your blood. Internal is between your blood and all these tissues that use and produce the gases. Okay. All right, so what's going to drive all this? It's diffusion. These gases are just going to diffuse down a gradient. And for diffusion, understand what influences diffusion. Let's go back to Fick's Law, which brought this up a long time ago. Remember that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area multiplied by the gradient. So if you've got a larger surface area, we have a huge surface area in our lungs. And the gradient, if the gradient goes up, 
then uh, diffusion goes up. This is, in this case, the gradient between what's in your alveoli and what's in your blood, or what's in your blood and those tissues getting served by the blood vessels. That's the gradient we're going to be looking at in this case. And it's inversely proportional to the membrane thickness. This is really thin. Remember the respiratory membrane. It's made up of one skinny layer of cells of the alveoli and one skinny layer of cells of those pulmonary capillaries. For internal gas exchange, it's just a thin layer of, um, of one layer of cells that make up those capillaries. Uh, let's fly by membrane resistance. How easy is it for these gases, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, to go across the walls of these blood vessels, for instance? Well, it's really easy. Oxygen and carbon dioxide just diffuse right across those cells, no problem. So let's just take a look at that respiratory membrane again real quick. So on the right, we've got a single uh, layer of cells making up the pulmonary capillary. You can see the red blood cells in there. The single layer of skinny cells making up the wall of the alveoli. Okay. Before we uh, take a deeper look into this gas exchange, we need to talk about gases dissolved in a, in a liquid. For oxygen to make it into our body, it first has to dissolve in water in our lungs before it can make it across that respiratory membrane. So we're going to have to pay close attention to gases dissolved in fluids, in water. So what are some of the things that contribute to how much gas is dissolved in a, uh, in a liquid? Well, temperature will play an important role. If you change the temperature of the liquid, you can hold more or less gas. Well, we uh, our bodies are set up to try and get that air that's in our alveoli right at our body temperature. So there is no thermal gradient between the alveolar space and inside our body. Remember, inhaling through your nose helps to heat that air up so that it can match your body temperature due to that blood flow uh, going through the lining of your nose. Also is dependent on the pressure gradient. So this is a, a big one that screws people up when gases are going to uh, diffuse, dissolved gases are going to diffuse from one area to the other, they do not diffuse based on concentration gradients. Instead, they diffuse based on pressure gradients. So a gas that's dissolved in a liquid still exerts a pressure in that liquid. If you've got a glass of water and there's oxygen in there, dissolved in that water, that oxygen has a partial pressure in there. And if that oxygen is going to diffuse from one part of the glass to the other, from the glass out into the atmosphere, it needs a pressure gradient, not a concentration gradient. So keep that in mind. All right, so here we've got um, our cardiovascular system. And down here we've got, this would represent the systemic capillaries. We've got some tissues down here that are going to use oxygen. Our lungs, our alveoli at the top, where um, we add oxygen to the system. So you can see that blood coming back into our lungs. It might come in with a partial pressure of oxygen. So P sub O2, that represents partial pressure of oxygen. The pressure that oxygen don't, um, contributes at, say, 40 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli might be at 100 millimeters of mercury. That's a pressure gradient. And so oxygen will diffuse, in this case, from the high pressure to the low pressure. And when it does that, it loads up that blood. So now when that blood leaves the lungs, it's at a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury. That blood gets sent down to these metabolizing tissues that has a partial pressure of oxygen at or below 40 millimeters of mercury. So now we've got another pressure gradient. Oxygen diffuses from a high pressure to a low pressure from the blood into those tissues. How does everybody feel about that? Lucy? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is a helpful question, but uh, why does it not go by concentration? I cannot explain the physical chemistry involved in that. Uh, I'd say just think about it just in gases, whether they're dissolved in liquid or they're in an atmosphere. Pressure gradients are what drive those gases, not the concentration. Right? And these gases, because they are in a gas state, the molecules are bouncing around and independent of their neighboring 
molecules, um, they're not you know sticking together, um, and so that's and that's where that pressure's come from. Those molecules bouncing around. So the more they're bouncing around, the more they're going to spread out from that area. But I can't explain why the concentration gradient is not contributing to it. They're related, but they're different. Okay, and we're going to relate them in a second. We could uh, look at the same graph, but in um, regards to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, you really want to get rid of extra carbon dioxide in the lungs and pick it up from the tissues. So the PCO2 coming into these metabolizing tissues might be at 40 millimeters of mercury. In those tissues, it might be a little higher, say at 46 millimeters of mercury. That's a pressure gradient. So we can add carbon dioxide to the blood here, carrying that 46 millimeter mercury partial pressure of carbon dioxide to the lungs, where it's maybe at 40 millimeters of mercury. Again, we've got a gradient. Carbon dioxide can diffuse from the blood, the pulmonary capillaries, into the alveoli. Okay. All right. So we talked about temperature, we talked about pressure gradient, that's what we just talked about there. Another contributor to how much gas is dissolved in a liquid is the gas's solubility. Solubility. So this is where we're actually going to relate concentration to pressure. So they are related, but they're not the same. So the solubility of a gas is the concentration of the gas in a liquid at a given pressure. So if the concentration goes up, the pressure goes up. Concentration goes down, the pressure goes down. So they're related to each other. <clears throat> the solubility of a specific gas varies depending on what liquid or what fluid, I should say, you're talking about. So the solubility of oxygen, for instance, in water is very different than the solubility of oxygen, say, in um, air. Let's look at some examples. Have we got this down? All right, so this one has to do with oxygen. Let's imagine that we've got some beaker of water exposed to the atmosphere, and this beaker of water starts with a partial pressure of oxygen at zero millimeters of mercury. There is no oxygen in here. We let this water equilibrate with the atmosphere on top that has 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen. We've got a pressure gradient here. Oxygen is going to diffuse from this atmosphere into the water. We let it go until it equilibrates so that there is 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen in the water. Also in this air, there's no pressure difference. There's no net diffusion that equilibrated. So we just loaded this water up with oxygen. Now let's go ahead and look at their concentrations, though, at these given pressures. So in air, with a partial pressure of oxygen at 100 millimeters of mercury, the concentration of oxygen is maybe 5.2 millimoles per liter. That's the concentration in air at that partial pressure. The concentration of oxygen in water at the same partial pressure is much, much lower, 0.15 millimoles per liter. So oxygen has a very different solubility in air compared to water. The main point to get out of this is water doesn't hold a lot of oxygen. It only takes a few molecules of oxygen to get this partial pressure to, say, 100 millimeters of mercury. So solubility for a given fluid is going to relate the partial pressure to the concentration. Yeah? Would you say that water holds uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide a lot better than water since you can have carbon in the sediment? Um, the water holds carbon dioxide better than, better than, than oxygen? oxygen. That's what yeah, so the solubility of carbon dioxide in water is higher than it is for oxygen in water which is rewording what you were saying, I think, right? Yes, so let's look at carbon dioxide, okay? So let's do the same little setup. We've got all the carbon dioxide out of the water down here. The air has 100 millimeters of mercury of carbon dioxide, oh, pressure, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Let those two equilibrate. So they're both at 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure. The solubility in air is at 5.2 millimoles per liter for carbon dioxide in water. It's at 3 millimoles per liter. Remember, oxygen, it was at 0.15. So water holds a lot more carbon dioxide at a given pressure than it does oxygen. Yes? Is that because it reacts with water and forms carbon dioxide? 
No, because that would not contribute to its partial pressure. Right? So if you combine water and carbon dioxide to form carbonic acid and bicarbonate that um, once you've combined those two, it no longer contributes to its pressure. Right? Just like the oxygen bound to hemoglobin in your blood is not contributing to oxygen's partial pressure in your plasma. You have a few more purple spheres to draw. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. How do you guys feel about solubility? Awesome. awesome. All right. So we've just talked about gas exchange, and that's both for external and internal gas exchange. All right, what drives that gas to change? It's pressure gradients. You need to look at the partial pressure of the gas that you're interested in. Okay. All right, the last part to talk about. We're doing good. We only have 40 more slides. <laughs> good, right? What's that? Talk fast. No, I won't try to just blaze through it, but we'll try to get some of it, and then you guys can finish it off with the lecture online. Gas transport. All right, so once these gases are in our blood, how do they get transported around in the cardiovascular system? Right. So the gases of interest, we've really already mentioned these, oxygen and carbon dioxide. We wanted to take a look at each of these. Um, do we just have bubbles of oxygen in our blood moving around? Hopefully not. That would be a big problem. Right. What's the problem with having bubbles? Would that just kind of tickle as it goes through our blood vessels? You what? Right, so little bubbles could combine together to form bigger bubbles. And most likely it wouldn't be one big bubble in your heart that displaces all the blood, but it would get caught in a constriction. So imagine a bubble that's, you know, maybe there's a tiny bubble. It goes through your aorta. No big deal. The aorta's a nice big vessel and doo -doo -doo, just passing along. Well, the aorta divides into smaller and smaller arteries, and eventually into tiny little arterioles and even smaller capillaries. And this little bubble that was huge or very small in your aorta is going to, relative to the diameter of the vessel, be really big compared to, say, a capillary. So if here's your capillary, now here comes that bubble, boop, acts like a cork. Right? And it blocks blood flow through that vessel. And so now whatever's downstream of that doesn't get any blood. And so that, that tissue starts to starve and can, can quickly die. So bubbles in your blood are not good. Right? So clearly that's not what's going on in our blood. There are ways you can get bubbles in your blood right? through, say, decompression sickness. Right? Um, but hopefully that's not going to happen to us. So, these um, gases have to be transported in a different way. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I don't know what that slide's for. Okay, <laughs> oxygen transport. How are you going to move oxygen around in our blood? Well, some of that oxygen is dissolved in our blood plasma. We just talked about dissolving it in, in, uh, in liquid, in water, which is going to be very similar to blood plasma. So remember this figure we just showed about um, oxygen dissolving in the water. It has some given concentration for a given partial pressure. It's not very high of a concentration. Remember that what determines if water, or I'm sorry, oxygen is going to um, diffuse since it's pressure gradient. But when it comes down to it, the cells, they care more about the concentration. They don't care what the pressure is. They just care, do I have oxygen molecules to work with or not? And so, yeah, the pressure gradient drives which way it moves, but we need to carry enough oxygen. And oxygen just dissolved in your blood plasma is not enough to serve the needs of your cells. So we need another mechanism or way to carry oxygen. So most all the oxygen in our blood is actually carried with hemoglobin. It's bound to hemoglobin. <coughs> Oh, 
hemoglobin is a protein found in our red blood cells. So you can think of your red blood cells as these packets of hemoglobin molecules. <clears throat> the hemoglobin molecule has four subunits to it. It kind of looks like this pretty Valentine's thing. <laughs> so each color represents a different subunit of this greater hemoglobin molecule. And each subunit has its own heme group in it. They look like funny microscope slides. Those heme groups can bind to an oxygen molecule. So each hemoglobin molecule can carry up to four oxygen molecules. So you can get one oxygen molecule bound to each heme group. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so with hemoglobin, it can bind to oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. And notice that arrow is double-headed. It goes in both directions. Thank goodness. It wouldn't do us any good to irreversibly bind oxygen to hemoglobin, because then we couldn't use it. So you want oxygen to stick to hemoglobin when you want to carry it, and you want it to let go of hemoglobin when you want to use the oxygen. Is it tertiary structure protein? Tertiary structure? Yeah. Um, I mean, like the, the way that it's all folded in the three dimensional, um, it has a tertiary structure. Like that's what we were trying to see with that drawing back there. All right, it's this big, massive protein. <clears throat> all right, so what we have here is our whole body in one little rectangle. Up here represents our alveoli where we pick up the oxygen, dissolves into the plasma makes its way into a red blood cell, can bind hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. And now this oxyhemoglobin can travel through the blood to some tissue that wants to use the oxygen. And in that case, we want the oxygen to dissociate from hemoglobin so that it's available for that tissue to use. So later on in these slides, we talk about what does it take to get it to stick to hemoglobin and what does it take to let go of hemoglobin. All right. For now, though, let's just look at the importance of having hemoglobin. So let's say we don't have hemoglobin. We just carry the oxygen that we can dissolved in blood plasma. Let's imagine we're working with 100 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of oxygen. How much oxygen do we actually have in our blood plasma? We could have, let's say, 3 milliliters of oxygen per liter of blood if we're only relying on oxygen dissolved in blood plasma. Okay? If we add hemoglobin, we can carry a lot more oxygen. So these funny looking pizzas represent um, hemoglobin molecules, and each little blue dot in there represents an oxygen molecule. About 98% of the oxygen we carry is bound to hemoglobin. So we can carry with oxygen bound to hemoglobin 197 milliliters of oxygen per liter of blood. For a total of, wow, that was a convenient round number, 200 milliliters of oxygen per liter of blood. Of course, these are sort of rounded, so we can work with them more easily. But that's a lot more oxygen than just relying on blood, um, oxygen dissolved in 